Walmarts, and most Walmarts have, are set up about the same way. And this little child, probably about uh, maybe 12 or 13 year, years old, yes. um, uh, mildly uh, had a mild case of uh, Down syndrome, Yes, uh, if I remember correctly. And he, this child walks up to me, and uh, this young man says, God loves you. Jesus loves you. And it kind of shocked me. Yeah. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't anything. It was nice. It was a nice message. And it totally broke the cycle that I was in with the depression with this young, young child. And it took me about a minute or two to collect myself. And after that, the whole feeling just left me of being depressed. And I was like, well, why in the world was I depressed over that? So I was going to go find this child. Uh, and, you know, I started looking around Walmart. I spent about 45 minutes going up and down all the aisles in Walmart and, and never could find this kid. And I actually asked about it in the NDE in or uh, yeah. queried about it. And yeah, yeah. It, was an, it was an angel. It yep, was an angel. De- definitely either human form or angel, but in disguise, Sean. That's great. And, again, we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much. Oh, yeah, no problem. Anytime, sir. Thank you. God bless you, Sean, and we'll talk to you later. God bless. All right. Okay, everybody, we are back on the Richard Spassoff Show for the last half hour. I feel like I'm on, on like, the 15th round of a fight. Oh, boy, I don't know. We'll find out soon here. But um, I've been having one of these rough days today. I think speaking is one of my main issues, but hey, it's working. Uh, next guest is Kim. Kim O'Connor, are you there? Yes, I am. Happy to How have you, you here. Today? Hey, good, good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. You're welcome. I was look, look looking at your uh, Facebook page, and it said that you studied uh, a you studied sci- psychology. How long did, did you do that for? Oh, I started that years ago when my kids were real little and I had just gotten a divorce. So I was doing that full time, working full time and taking care of my kids, my kids full time. But I had to um, stop something. So that was it. And I kind of regret it, but I, I had to do what I had to do because my kids come first. That's and okay. I should have yeah. went back. Yeah. It's okay. And you're, you're, we're not. The chapter hasn't ended yet, so... No, no, by far not. And uh, you also went to the same school that I did, I'm surprised, the Joan Crawford School of Hard Knocks. Uh, yes, I think many of us did. What Back year? in our days, uh, <laughs> many of us did. <laughs> what year did you make it through? I mean... I'm still trying to make it through. <laughs> last year was my like my last trip with that. I can't do it no more. <laughs> Now you it are me. <laughs> you are a uh, um, spirit. What you call what? What would you call yourself? I, I I've been. I think I fall under a lot of categories, not just particularly one. I communicate with the spirits. I do spirit writing, automatic writing, if you will. Okay. And I can communicate with the other side. Um, just a lot of different things. Parent work with paranormal like to send those spirits back home to, because that's where they belong. Now, but not all of them will choose. Now, this got started when you were four years old. Is that correct? Well, yeah, it, I would say that it's, that was my first round of starting to see things. And what kind of things? What, what appeared? Well, the first thing I can remember that was so odd was um, seeing like a robot what I know is a robot now um, in the window at night. But the people that took care of me from two months until eight year, until I was eight years old, they never seen it, and it was right in front of them. And apparently it wasn't meant for them to see it, but it was meant for me to see it. But yet I didn't express anything. I didn't, I mean, I was scared on the inside. I can still see it to this day, but I never said anything out loud, you know, to them. You know what? It's funny you say that because it, uh, with me, I was the op- opposite. I remember a 
the vision I had when I was about five years old looked like a gingerbread man with fangs, right? With blood coming down its face. Right. And it scared the heck out of me, Kim. And the following day, it was so real to me. I asked my parents if I could find this thing. I I tore the house apart looking for it. Now, what stopped you from trying to figure out what that was? What? I was the only child that lived with them. They weren't even married. They just, it was friends of my grandmother's that volunteered to take care of me. Okay. Um, It's not that I I probably couldn't, but I don't know why. I I have no explanation as to why I didn't. It's just, I didn't. Just now, when you were, you were saying in sixth grade, you had quite a bit, before we go into more stories, you have... Did, did, in the sixth grade, would you say this is when you started to open up a little bit more to the? Um, absolutely. Well, I before that, I was I I ended up at eight years old going back with my uh, mom and my second stepdad at that point, um, and I was taking care of my helping take care of my sisters and everything. But my family was not one that you could talk to because they already thought it was crazy because I could see and hear things. And they wanted to take me to a psychologist because of that. So I learned at an early age, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You can't talk to them. You know, you, so I had to suppress and keep things to myself. So that's, uh, I became a, like a loner. Oh. So I started being obsessed with reading books and collecting rocks and just finding out. I like to learn. I can't learn enough. So a library is like heaven for me with uh-huh. all the knowledge that's in it. And I've always felt like that, but I used to, but I did a science report, a book report, and we had to do it out loud. And I wasn't good at speaking, and still, still I'm not in front of a group of people. But I remember I wasn't really afraid this time, and I couldn't. I was kind of excited to um, get this report read to be, to the point to where at the end I said, you know, we would be fools to think that we were the only beings on all these plants and stars. And my teacher, I remember, just gave me a weird look. The, the class was, like, dead silent. <laughs> and hey. my teacher then told me to hold on and then went out, got another teacher, had me read that whole report again, and then looked at each other at the end when I said that. You know, my last uh, sentence, we would be fools to think that we were the only ones on all these stars and planets of all the, of the universe, you know, which we would be. So, And I think that was the beginning. Yeah, not only once did he have to read this in front of class, but twice. Twice, right. And and this was a time where you were not really, you kept to yourself for all these years, and now you're finally, oh, I am. yeah, you're, you're op- o- opening yourself up. How did that feel? Right. How, how did that feel for you? Well, it, it's been a, it, it's been a process, but the, when things first started really opening, it's like they they have to. People, there's too many of us that know the truth about things, or and there's too many that are looking for the truth on things. And for those of us that have the knowledge, need to share because it doesn't. Knowledge doesn't do one person any good unless it's shared. Yes. I mean, it's not going to do one person a whole lot of good until you share it with everybody else, because everybody's eyes, you know. That everybody opens their eyes at, at their own time. Their own awakening happens. And I think people could only take in so much. Even if we experience something, people may not understand what we have experienced, right? Well, not only what we haven't experienced, but they might even experience more, but yet kept to themselves as well for fear of ridicule because yeah. I went through all of that too. And then finally, finally, finding somebody that they can share their experience with or, you know, understand a little bit better and have conversation with. That's why I think that these groups are really good to uh, go into. And also like with the radio station, people are more, you, you get the word expanded a lot more better. Yes. Yes. The, the people get a chance to use this as not only entertainment and the paranormal, but therapy. What can I say? No, it's therapy and it's a tool. Yes. It's a yes, helpful tool. Yes, yes. It really truly is. I mean, it, 
many of them will think of it, well, just like a lot of movies. There's so many movies that are in TV series that have so much truth to them that um, they just look at it, and a lot of people just look at them as entertainment, whereas a lot of us that are, are already awakened know that there's more truth to them than they know. Mm-hmm. And that they really should, you know, be more aware of, and that's where the groups come in because we have, you know, certain groups have uh, some. Some of them have particular subjects that matter that they stay on, whereas um, others have a big wider expansion, you know, of uh, subject matter that can be talked about. It's more versatile. Exactly, and and, and depending on how open that group is, yes, yes. Right, it's according to, it's according to um, a lot of the group members, you know, now, to share it when. Exactly, and but you you were talking to me. We were talking over the phone, and you were telling me a, a paranormal experience about your friend when you were eleven years old. Would you like to talk about that? When I was eleven. Yeah, the one that committed suicide. Oh yeah, it was a family member. Okay. And um, he, he, they, him and his wife owned a bar around the corner from us, not even a block away, basically really around the corner. And he committed suicide. And back in there, back in my time, we went to bed at eight o'clock, and it was still daylight out. And I was in bed, and he all of a sudden he appeared at the end of my bed. It was like they had just received the call, but nobody had told me. But I already knew that he was dead. So and, he, but I was scared to death. <laughs> <laughs> he he and came so I by. I covered my head up with a sheet. <laughs> uh, he came by to say hello to you. Then he came by to. to well, he was there. He was there uh, like several nights in a row. Okay. And each night, I mean, it was like for like a week or two, and but it didn't make things any easier because I still had never dealt with death before. Mm-hmm. Yes. I didn't know of anybody that had died before. Well, I can't say that, uh, but I mean, I never dealt with it on a personal level. Right. And so definitely this was my first spirit um, appearance, I would say. And yeah, I wasn't sure how to take it and uh, definitely couldn't talk to nobody. So again, suppressed until I'm old enough or can figure out where to go look in the library and understand about these things. And this is how I went through my whole life, trying to figure things out. It's not easy, but do you think your your friend that committed to suicide, do you think he was lost and he came for you for help? Did he talk to you prior a lot for help? Or? No, I know. I was I was leery of him. I really wasn't comfortable with him. He was a friend of mine's dad, actually, okay. a classmate's of dad. And I don't know. I guess he must have taken a liking to me, but he yeah. always asked me to, you know, asked me to, you know, go to like picnics and stuff, but never went. Um, I, I just was kind of like a loner as a child. Um, a lot of, a lot of abuse and everything within the family unit, but so I kept to myself. I was the oldest child, so I took care of five of their siblings. But um, and maybe that's what he kind of wanted to take to me, you know what I'm saying? Uh, kind of yeah. maybe felt sorry for me or whatever, but I, I, I've never worked on anybody's sympathy like that because I didn't need it. To understand now, things myself is what I needed to do. Exactly. And your whole life has been, I mean, you've been in so many different paranormal situations. There was one yeah. you were telling me about your dad's cemetery trip. You want to tell everybody about that? It wasn't my dad's cemetery trip. It was a friend of mine's uh, boyfriend, his oh, friend. I'm sorry. It was my dad. And then <laughs> we talk about your friend. We didn't, we didn't go check out your dad. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we had, um, my friend had went and talked to, I, I, I had her as a friend at work and she was, they were, her and her boyfriend was putting together a paranormal group that they wanted to start. So I said, fine. She asked me if I would go with them to a house that they thought was haunted or whatever. And I said, well, yeah, I'll go. I'll go. Well, it was really, really dark. I think it was like 10 o'clock at night. So it's pitch dark. And we were driving. They were driving. I was in the back seat. And where they took me, there was absolutely no street lights. I mean, it was black as black can be outside. No sign of life. 
and we were driving and driving, and I asked her, I said, uh, 